Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. I think I think what I, I, I'd like to do, if this is okay with Pastor Pastor Matt. If I can just invite Philip up to pray over the meeting, is that okay? Philip, you just come up here. Now remember, you're just praying. Okay, you're not preaching. You're not prophesying over every individual. And this is my brother Philip, whom I love very much. He's a man of God. So I'm going to ask Pastor Philip just to pray a blessing over this church over God's presence with us here tonight, Pastor Philip. Okay, can we just, can we stand, please? Uh, Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the great things that you have prepared for us. Thank you, Lord, that you never let us go disappointed, Lord. I pray for every individual that came here with their requests, spoken or unspoken. You know them, Lord. And I pray in the name of Jesus that they will meet their needs. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray also for the man of God, that, Father, you will use him to speak your word into the hearts of people, oh God. Thank you, Father, Lord. Every person here is different. So also is our needs. And you know all of them, Lord. Thank you for today. Let your glory be seen in this place. Now, thank you for this church, the great things that you are doing, and the things that you are about to do. I give you our glory, Lord. That's a big plan. That's a big plan. Thank you, Father, that you are so good that we just sung about your goodness, Lord. We give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord, if you'd like to take your seats. Okay, can you just, um, can you just raise your hands if you were here last night? Oh, okay, that's most people. That's good because what I'm, what I'm really going to do tonight is part two of what we looked at yesterday. And I'm going to try and bring us into a practical application of some of the things that we looked at yesterday in God's Word. So just a brief recapitulation. What we looked at is that in the Bible, when God was instituting new things, bringing blessing, bringing covenants, bringing a mighty miracle or something of substance, he did it over a meal or during what, what is termed in the Bible a banquet that Greek word diepnon, sometimes it's translated supper, meal, uh, celebration, feast, uh, usually banquet, but it means all of these things. And we looked at some of the obvious ones, but I'm sure if you, uh, if you think about all the stories in the Bible, in fact, one brother came to me afterwards and said, you know, after the resurrection, the, uh, the disciples didn't recognize Jesus on the road to Emmaus until they had the supper. And it wasn't at the breaking of the bread. It was when they were eating, that's when they recognized it was the Lord. Now, remember, he'd been talking to them. He'd been uh, speaking to them. He'd been uh, making their hearts burn within them, which is what a preacher's job is. A preacher's job is to speak the word to raise your faith, to get you to connect with the reality and the, the living truthfulness of God's word. But ultimately, you've got to recognize Jesus and they recognized him when they broke bread with him. And we looked at the obvious examples, not just in the Old Testament, but we looked at what we call the Last Supper where Jesus broke the bread and wine and said, this is my body and this is my blood that is given to you for the forgiveness of sins. This is the new covenant in my blood. And we looked at that and how Jesus said, do this whenever you gather in remembrance of me. 
And so we looked at this thing called the, the feast, the Lord's Supper, the communion meal. It has lots of different terminology. But then we looked that if you jump forward right to the end of the Bible, if you jump forward to the book of Revelation, there's a culmination of all God's promises in what's called the wedding supper of the Lamb, which is described in at least two occasions in Revelation chapter 19. And this is where the bride, the church, the people of God finally are brought together with the Lord into the fullness of the kingdom, the kingdom being established on earth. So it starts with a supper, celebration feast, um, a banquet, and then the Bible ends with this banquet, celebration, wedding feast. And we looked at the fact that we're in the middle of these two events. So we are at the banquet in the middle of the banquets of God. We're still at a banquet. We're still at a feast. We're still at a wedding supper. And even if you look at the feasts, the, the, the religious feasts in the Bible, the Moedim, you know, from Passover to Pentecost to the final one of Tabernacles, which they all revolve around a feast, we're, at, we're in the middle. We're in the one where the Holy Spirit has come down. He hasn't gone yet. When he goes, he takes the church with him. And the final one, the dwelling of God with man, the tabernacling, the Sukkot of God is yet to come when Jesus returns to earth. So we are at the feast in the middle. We're at the banquet of God in the middle of time. And if we want to be at the final celebration of God, the banquet of God, We've obviously got to understand the meaning of the original one. We've got to know what the breaking of bread is. We've got to know what the blood of Jesus is. We've got to celebrate that his blood forgives us of our sins and that we are now part of his church, the body of Christ, which is what he said the bread was, which is broken for us. And we obviously believe in the final one, or we wouldn't be here. We believe that Jesus is coming to bring the fullness of all his promises that he is coming again, that the kingdom of God is literally coming on earth because Jesus said it was and the Bible says it is and we know that that is going to be what we call the wedding supper of the lamb, which is actually quite a, a, a prolonged feast. But we're at the one in the middle. We're at the one right now and we looked at Jesus' parables, how Jesus continually talked about the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. The kingdom of heaven is, is like a meal. The kingdom of heaven is like this supper. And when Jesus gave the parables, there was nearly always a banquet involved. In fact, when he gave his end time parables in Matthew, what we call the Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew 24 and 25, um, it's really talking about different feasts. It starts with the, the marriage feast, then it talks about the, uh, the wise and foolish virgins who were going to a wedding feast. But only five of them actually got there. And this is a very sobering parallel, par parable because Jesus specifically uses the example of virgins going to a wedding. So he's not talking about people who don't believe. He's talking about people who say they believe but don't practice it. Because otherwise he wouldn't have used the example of virgins. He would have just said people. But he gave the example of the wedding feast. Now, the, the people that you expect at the, at the wedding are the brides. And he's saying even some of the people who thought they were going didn't go. And then he gave the examples of the, the excuses people gave for not attending the wedding feast. And the, the first thing you've got to do is obviously accept the invitation. Uh, the second thing you've got to do is actually go. The third thing you've got to do is you've got to have the right attitude. You've got to be dressed for the wedding, Jesus said. The man who wasn't dressed was thrown out of the wedding banquet. Uh, you've got to have the right uh, attitude when you're there, taking the correct seat, serving, worshipping, fulfilling your duties as the bride of Christ, part of the church, but also as servants of Jesus Christ. And we looked at those yesterday. And one of the things that Western Christians we're not very good at grasping, is that when Jesus taught, especially when he used his parables, he used a system of, um, 
rabbinic Jewish teaching, which is called Midrash. And he would tell parables. And we are supposed to understand what each part of the parable means. And so he would specifically state things in parables. And he would know that people who knew their Bible, they would know what that thing in that parable represented. So when he said the virgins had no oil, he would expect you to know what the oil represents. When the good Samaritan pours in the oil and the wine, he expects us to know what the wine and the oil represent. They're very strong pictures of aspects of God's grace in the Bible. He expects us to know that. And actually the whole Bible is one huge parable about what God is trying to do. Now, when we're looking at this thing that's called the banquet, the communion supper, the, the, the meeting of the bride with her bridegroom, the wedding supper, the meeting of God's people with the Lord himself, there's one story in the Bible, right in the middle of the Bible, that is probably the best parabolic way of teaching the understanding of this banquet. And this is the book of Esther. Now, if you've read the book of Esther, you might, you might have noticed it's a very strange book. For a start, it's, it's chronologically right at the end of the Old Testament. It's, it's the oldest narrative story in the Bible, uh, the last narrative story in the Bible. And as I'm sure you know, God's, God's never actually mentioned in the whole book. Never once. God is never mentioned you assume he's there. You assume all the way through the book of Esther that God is there, but he's never explicitly mentioned by name. He's never talked about. The word God is never referred to. And that's because what God's doing, he's, he's using the book of Esther as a very big parable of how he operates. In the same way that when Jesus told a parable, Jesus didn't mention God. Think about it. The story, the parable of the prodigal son, God's never mentioned. The parable of the lost sheep, God's never mentioned. The parable of the lost coin, God's never mentioned. The parable of the good Samaritan, God's never mentioned. But you assume, rightly, that in the parable, God is showing his reality through the parable. So you know in the parable of the prodigal son that the father in the story represents God. You know in the parable of the lost sheep that the, the shepherd represents Jesus. You know this automatically, but it doesn't say that in the parable. God assumes we will grasp that. So when we read in the book of Esther, God assumes, expects us to know what's going on in this story, what each of the people represent. Now, it is a true story. It did really happen. But God, through this narrative, through this, this little book that God's never even mentioned, he's showing us something extremely powerful. And, and sadly, so many, so many Christians miss this. The first thing I want us to understand about the book of Esther, it's a story of seven banquets. It's a story of seven feasts, seven meals. And as you know, the number seven is the number of perfection. And each one of these seven banquets, each one of these seven meals in the book of Esther is a, is a, is a, a living parable of what we looked at yesterday. It's a picture of the banquet God is trying to lavish upon us. And it's a picture of the banquet that he expects us to grasp, assimilate, and understand so that we can come out victorious in the same way Esther did. But if we don't understand what the banquet means, the story of Esther won't make much sense. So let's, let's go to the book of Esther. Let's go to the book of Esther. We'll start at the beginning, chapter 1, and we'll do a quick run-through of the whole book. Is that okay? We should be able to finish it in about eight hours. <laughs> Esther, chapter 1. 
my, uh, my youngest daughter is with me. She sat there. Now, she's heard me talk about Esther before. So she's already said to me, Dad, you're not going to be more than an hour, are you? Because she's heard that Pastor Matt's putting some pizza on for us afterwards. So she understands the banquet. She's already thinking about it afterwards. So I'll try and keep this brief. I won't prolong it, but I do want us to see some important things. Esther chapter 1. Let's go to verse, well, let's, let's start at verse 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes Ahasuerus. Uh, Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Kush. This king ruled the known world. In fact, his title, the king of Persia, um, his title was king of kings and lord of lords. That's what they referred to as this king. He gave himself that title. And so he's not just... It's not just the superpower of the world, which Persia was in, uh, in, in that time of antiquity, but he's ruling the whole known world. So he's very powerful. In fact, he's almost ultimately powerful on the planet at that time. Verse 2. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, 180 days, he displayed his vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and the glory of his majesty. And so the book of Esther starts with the greatest banquet the world had ever seen. A feast, a meal that lasted six months. And everyone from the whole world, all the nobles and officials from all the provinces of this king of kings, of the superpower of the world that ruled the whole world at that time, invited people from all these provinces. This is a massive banquet. And you will see from the terminology, you will notice that the terminology used of this king is usually the same terminology that's reserved for God himself. The splendor of his majesty is revealed in this banquet. This is the king of kings. This is the, the ruler of everything. It's, it's almost as if the book of Esther starts by saying there's a king who's almost like God. And he puts on this huge banquet and his plan is to bring all of his people from all of his empire to this banquet. And it's going to last for six months. In other words, it's just going to go on and on and on and on. A bit like some church services you've been in. And so Esther starts with this banquet and the terminology is reminiscent of God himself. And so right at the beginning of the book of Esther, we're being shown that the people at that time, it says, at that time, they're being told that their ruler wants to give them all a banquet. He's planning for them all to partake and participate in this immense festival that includes festivities and feasts and is used in this terminology of a banquet. And this is what this king had planned. Remember Midrash, what's God trying to show us here? You'll see this in a moment when we look at this. God is trying to show us, look, if this is what an earthly king had planned at the beginning of his monarchy, what do you think God's planned for you? If this king great as he is, but still limited, plans for all his people to be at this banquet that just goes on indefinitely, what do you think God has planned for you? Because we know that God's told us, I know the plans I have for you, to prosper you, to not harm you, to give you a hope and a future. The Bible tells us we can't even imagine what God has got planned for us. But we do know it's a banquet because he's told us that. 
He's told us that much. He's told us it's a wedding banquet. Jesus said it over and over again. He's told us it's coming. He's told us we've got to be ready. He's told us we're invited. He's told us that it's going to be the greatest banquet that the universe has ever seen. He's told us it's going to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven on earth. He's told us all of these things. He's told us we should be practicing this banquet now, feasting with him now, receiving the bread and wine now. So he's already told us all this. But the book of Esther starts by reminding us, look, if this king's planned this... And Xerxes wasn't a particularly nice guy, history tells us. By the way, if anyone's ever interested in archaeology, archaeologists have actually uncovered the, um, the cuneiform tablets in, in clay that describe this banquet written in the Bible. They've actually found the archaeological evidence that describe this banquet, inviting all the people from all the world to this banquet. They found the, if you like, the invitation cards written on tablets of clay. So here's what's happening. God is reminding us once again what God's plan is. God's plan is to get you to this banquet because God is the superpower of the world. You do know that. It's not America. It's God. You know, the British used to think it was them. The British used to rule half the, you know, a quarter of the, the globe and we don't anymore, but we're not bothered. It was too big to run anyway. You know, that's why most countries hate us, because we used to rule them at one point. But they got rid of us, and that's fine. You know, we outstayed our welcome. We're fine about that. We're not bitter. Whatever. But whoever's running the world, there has nothing compared to what God's plan for the world is. There's going to be one ruler of the world. He's called Jesus Christ. There's going to be one kingdom on earth. It's called the kingdom of heaven. Antichrist is going to try and deceive people that he's running it, but he's not. The governments of the world don't know what they're doing. Only Jesus is fit. He's the only man. He's the only man anointed by God who can literally run this world and inaugurate the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so we've got an example then. So first banquet in Esther is just a reminder of how great God is. Okay? Right, let's just go to verse 5 then, the next verse. When these days were over, the king gave another banquet. Did you get that? Now, you've just been in a banquet for six months. You have just been at a party that has lasted for six months. And you're getting ready to go home. And the king says, right, we're going to have another banquet. And this one's going to be better than the last one. Remember, this is midrash. This is parabolic teaching. Just when you think you've grasped everything God's doing and giving you, guess what? God is going to show you he's got something even better planned. You know, I've just chatted with my brother Philip uh, this afternoon when we were having a coffee together and, and we were saying, just when we think we've received what God had promised, we actually realize, no, we haven't. And God taps us on the shoulder and says, uh, no, this isn't it. I've got something bigger. It's like when Abraham had Ishmael and says, oh, that Ishmael will live on my, under, under your blessing. And God says, uh, no, I've got something better for you. You're going to have a greater son. Something greater is going to happen. So banquet number one is over. Stage one is over. The goodness of God. But now we've got stage two. Now we've got another banquet. And the king says he's going to put another banquet on. So... Verse 5 of chapter 1. So when those days were over, the king gives another banquet. Now listen to this. Lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace. Midrash. When God is using numbers, symbols, places, he wants you to link that with what he originally meant. Does seven days in a garden ring a bell? It should. Does seven days and then a king in a garden, does that remind you of something? It should remind you, this is the beginning of Esther, it should remind us of the beginning of God's creation. 
because that's exactly what God did at the beginning in Genesis 1 and 2. Seven days, and then God, in a garden, brings people into a garden. God's showing us something very powerful here, and his plan is to have another banquet, but this time, the banquet's going to be in a garden, and it's going to be seven days. God's showing us not just his great plans, he's now showing us the stages of his creation. He's showing us a pattern. He's showing us a blueprint to what that plan is. He's bringing us, he's inviting us into his plans. When Jesus brought his disciples into the banquet at the upper room, when they were drinking bread and, when they were eating bread and drinking wine, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I now call you friends, because servants don't really know what I'm doing, but I tell my friends. There's a stage where you don't know what God's doing, you just trust by providence that his plans are right. But God doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to bring you into another banquet of intimacy where he wants to actually explain the stages of what he's creating, of what he's doing. A lot of people never get to stage two. A lot of people stay blind, stay in ignorance. Do you know why? They don't have the six months of intimacy. If you'd not had the six months at the original banquet, you wouldn't get the seven days of the next banquet. If you went home before the six months were over, the 180 days over, you wouldn't understand the explanation of what God was going to do next. You know, me, and, me and Pastor Philip were talking again this afternoon, saying how a lot of people, when, even when they're fasting and praying, they stop before they get the revelation. They stop the level of intimacy with God before they get the full download of explanation of what God really wants to do. They leave just with the faith that God's got good plans. And you, and you do have to have that. But God wants to explain more about what's happening. So he invites people to another banquet. This one is only seven days. It's a picture of God's creation. So let's, let's read on. So, he gives the banquet lasting seven days in the garden of the king's palace from the, for all the people, from the least to the greatest. Notice everyone's invited to this banquet. But it's in a garden. It must be a big garden. But by the way, this is Persia. This is, uh, this is in Persepolis, the capital city of Persia. The Greek word, um, the, um, the Hebrew word is gan for garden. The Persian word for garden is paradiso. When Jesus spoke to the thief on the cross, he didn't say, today you will be with me in heaven. He didn't say, today you will be with me in the kingdom of God. He said, today you will be with me, and he used that word, paradiso, paradise. He said, today you'll be with me in the garden. Why did he use that word? Didn't say heaven. That's what we say. We say they've gone to heaven. Jesus says, you come into the garden with me. I'm taking you to the banquet. And so we've got this description here of the seven days, which is linked to the beginning of God's plan, the seven days of creation. It's linked to paradise. It's linked to the garden. And everyone's invited. And verse 6, the garden had hangings of white and blue linen, which are symbols of the tabernacle, by the way. Because the tabernacle, the original paradise and temple of God was the garden in Eden. Fastened with cords of white linen, purple material, silver rings on marble pillars. All pictures of the temple and the tabernacle. God wants us to come into his dwelling place. The temple itself. On a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl and other costly stones. Just like the new Jerusalem and the temple. Full of costly stones. Stones, wine was served in goblets of gold. So you've got the wine of forgiveness, you've got the gold of God's holiness and righteousness, which is what that represents in the tabernacle. And each one was different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant. Jesus always gives more wine than you need. He did that at the banquet in the wedding, in keeping with the king's liberality. So God is showing us through every single one of those words. The jewels, the gold, the linen, the silver, the wine, they are all pictures of his banquet in his temple. 
in his garden. From Genesis to Revelation, that's what they represent. God's showing us in more intimacy, like he revealed to Moses what all those things meant when Moses had to build the tabernacle. He gave him a detailed blueprint of what he was building, what kind of church he wanted, because the church is the temple of God. And so God is showing us now in real detail what he wants, but you only get that information if you're at the banquet. If you're not at the banquet, you don't see any of that. You just hear the descriptions, but you're not experiencing it. You hear there's wine there, but you're not drinking it. You hear that there's gold there, but you're not seeing it. What God wants is he wants us to experience this reality, not just mentally assimilate it, because that's the trap of the devil. That's the tree of knowledge. The trap of the devil is because you've got something in your head, it's real. It isn't. What you've got in your head is a mental faculty, a mental assent that you think that's true. That doesn't mean it's a living reality in your life. It's only a living reality in your life if you're doing it. It's only a living reality in your life if you're living it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a theological fact in your head. It's a living endowment of power that comes upon you and flows through you and Jesus says flows out of you. And if that's not happening, you need to question whether you have him. It's not something that's in your head. Jesus said, didn't say, rivers of living water will flow out from your head. He said, rivers of living water will flow out from, and the, the literal word is belly. Your version might say your innermost being. It's literally the innermost part of you. Jesus purposely didn't say head. Because he was talking to people, Jewish Pharisees, who stored everything up in their head. And that because they thought they got it in their head, they thought they were living it. No. You can, you can imagine all kinds of crazy stuff in your head. Doesn't mean it's real. No, they had to be there. They had to be at the banquet. You've got to be in the presence of God. We've got to be gathered around this thing that God calls the communion table, the bread and the wine, the purpose of Christ himself. Jesus says, when we meet, we do this, because when we do this, he's there, and the Holy Spirit flows. That's why he came upon them in the upper room, because they were doing what he told them to do. So you've got all this description. Wine is served in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. Ah, that's dangerous, Pastor Matt. That's dangerous. No pastor ever says that, do they? No pastor ever says, do what you want. You end up with a crazy church. But it's not saying, do what you want. He's saying there's, there's the wine that is abundant for whatever you need. The wine, Jesus says, is his blood that gives you the forgiveness, the grace. His grace never runs out if you receive it. There's always more. There's always more grace. There's always more abundance. Wine is a picture of blessing in the Bible. And so God is showing there's always more blessing. There's always more grace. There's always more liberality. Doesn't mean they could get drunk and act crazy it meant that they could receive the blessing of God in their lives because the king was making sure they would have enough and this is an earthly carnal king how much more is God going to give you the grace now his blood has been shed the blood of his son has been shed the sins have been forgiven you can now enter this garden you can now sit at this table you can now feast at this banquet you can now receive the goodness of God so you get the picture you've got the seven days you've got the garden you've got you can eat what you want you can feast on everything God has given what did God say after seven days in the garden you may eat of any tree in the garden except that one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God is literally saying you can eat anything 
from any tree. There's even the tree of life there that gives you eternal life. But don't eat from that tree. What did Eve do? Instead of focusing on the goodness of God, she focused on the one thing God asked her not to do. Has any of you got kids? Have you ever told your kids, you can do any of this, but you can't do that? What is the one thing they want to do? You say to your children, do not touch that. You ever say to your kids, do not go into that room? Which room are they going to go in when you're not looking? Why is that? The king is giving as much wine and as much food and as much, as much blessing at this banquet as you could, but yet... Are some people not going to do it? Well, in, in the seven days in the garden in the original creation, it was the bride of the king of earth because God made Adam the king and queen, Eve the queen because he said, rule over all creation. So the original king and queen in the original garden after the original seven days were told they could have anything they wanted, just don't do the one thing. Shall we read the next verse? Let's read the next verse. The queen, Vashti, verse 9, also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, God reminding us again, when the king Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, when his goodness and his blessing is flowing the most, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, I'll not name them all, but the seven are there, to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Seven days in a garden and then the king walking in the garden asked the queen to come and she says no she's eating something else does that sound familiar isn't that exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 God came into the garden in the cool of the day and the bride refused to come because she was hiding away because she was eating her own food. Queen Vashti refuses to come because she's having her own banquet. Why do so many Christians not want to come to the banquet the church is putting on because they insist on putting on their own banquet? Why, does, why do people do that? Why do people put their own ministry more important than the ministry of the church? Because all ministry is to support the church. Queen Vashti is doing her own thing. She doesn't want to come into the garden. She doesn't want to sit at the banquet of the king. She'd rather do her own thing. I'm having my own food, thank you very much. I don't need yours. The next verse tells us that the king became furious and burned with anger. And if you read the rest of the chapter... It says that the queen was banished and could never enter the garden or the presence of the king again. That's exactly what happened in Genesis. God banished them from the garden. He's saying, well, if you're not going to eat at my banquet, you, you can go outside and you can eat thorns and thistles. You can live by the sweat of your own brow. You can try and, you can try and live life your own way. But I'll tell you one thing, you're never eaten from the tree of life again. It's guarded by the cherubim now. You're not getting that. You have no access to that banquet. You're banished. Notice he sent the seven eunuchs to tell her that. Whenever you see eunuch in the Bible, whenever you see un uh, these unnamed messengers, it's always a midrashic picture of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see an unnamed messenger, God's showing us something. Jesus says he doesn't come in his own name, the Holy Spirit. But he takes the commands from my father. He takes that which is mine and makes it known to you. She wasn't listening to the eunuch. She wasn't listening to the king. She's not listening to the Holy Spirit. She's doing her own thing. Be very careful as a Christian 
You're not just doing your own thing and justifying it in your own eyes. Make sure you're at the banquet God wants you to be at. You're, you're serving in the church. You're a part of the fellowship of God's people where all these people came together. Don't ever put your own tastes, as we saw last night, above the banquet of God. Make sure you're seated at the right place. Make sure we're where we should be because Vashti blew it and she ended up banished and she never came into the presence of the king again. Adam and Eve blew it. They were thrown out of the garden after that seven days. They were eating their own thing and God said, you will surely die. They didn't get it. They lost their place. And we all know the sorry story of mankind since they did that. Their children and their grandchildren all died because of a result. So is that the end of the story? No, fortunately, that's the beginning of the story. That's just chapter one. Ten more chapters to go. So, God's plan has been wrecked. The king's plan has been wrecked. The king put on this banquet and his own wife refused to come. I mean, that's not a very good supper, is it? If your own wife doesn't even want to come to your party, you know, it's probably not a very good party. Well, it was a good party, it was a good banquet, but she refused to come. So the king's plans were wrecked. And if you read the story, the king soaked for about a whole year. He really wasn't happy that he planned this great thing and she refused to attend it. And so the plan was wrecked, but the king is going to put another plan in place. Jump to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Now, the decrees of the Persians and the Medes couldn't be revoked. The king could make another law, but he couldn't, you couldn't revoke a previous law. So she couldn't come into his presence. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai. By the way, Hag, Haggai is, is Hebrew for feast, banquet. The king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young women, the young woman, sorry, who, pre, who pleases the king to be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king and he followed it. So what was the king's plan? The king's plan was to find another bride. Remember what the story of Esther is. It's a story of the Bible in miniature. It's a very condensed, simple version of God's plan from Genesis to Revelation. What was God's plan when he lost Eve in the garden and Adam followed her? Well, God's plan was his same plan that he had all along because God, God doesn't have a plan B because God's, God's omniscient. He always knows what's going to happen. God's plan was always to get another bride. God's plan was always to find another perfect woman for his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And so the story of the Bible is God's plan to find the perfect bride. The king and the eunuchs, the father, the son, and Holy Spirit, their plan from the beginning of creation is to get another bride. Because God's going to send another Adam. The Bible calls him the last Adam. We know him as Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The perfect man. Another perfect man is going to come to earth. But this perfect man isn't just a perfect man. He's God incarnate. So what kind of bride is going to be good enough for him? A pure, spotless, holy, righteous bride who's going to be ready for the wedding banquet. And so the eunuchs, the Holy Spirit, is sent out to all the world to find 
all the young virgins, all the beautiful women, all the people who can qualify to be a part of this bride. That's what God's plan in plan is. This is the banquet in the middle. We've had the first banquet running into the second banquet, but now there's going to be another banquet. The next banquet in Esther is the wedding banquet. It's the third banquet. But for this banquet to take place, the king's got to have a bride. And she's got to be the best. And she's got to be perfect. And she's got to be beautiful. And she's got to be holy. And she's got to be righteous. And she's got to be pure. And she can't be stubborn. And she can't be sinful like the previous one. And she's got to be someone who honors her bridegroom, who wants to obey him, who wants to submit to him, unlike the previous one who wanted to have her own way and do her own banquet. This new bride is you. You're the church of Jesus Christ. You're the bride of Christ. The church of God is the bride of Christ. Right? When, when, when Jesus came and John the Baptist was baptizing all the believers, he says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. You belong to him now. I'm just washing you. Just like the eunuchs are washing these women. Let them be washed. Let them be clean. Let them be pure. That's why in Hebrews 5, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and, and, and onwards, it says, uh, husbands, wash your Wives with the water of the word, making her purely and spotless and holy. And then he says, I'm not talking about husbands and wives. I'm talking about Christ and the church. And as we read yesterday in Revelation chapter 19, the, the wedding supper, the banquet of the lamb has come. Jesus has come to the wedding banquet and his bride has made herself ready. Pure, holy, white linen garments are given her to wear. You are clothed in the Holy Spirit, so you are holy, because he's the Holy Spirit. You're clothed in the garments of salvation, the garments of praise, so that you are ready now, for if Jesus comes right now, you're already ready. Because he might come right now. Because what Jesus told us is, the virgins that are ready, one day the shout goes, the bridegroom's here, and they go into the wedding banquet. And the ones that weren't ready got left. You've got to be ready. And so the search goes out. There's always a search for the perfect bride. If you've read my book, you'll know this. Every one of the men of God in the Bible, whether it's Abraham, whether it's Isaac, whether it's Jacob, whether it's Judah, whether it's King David, whether it's Solomon, doesn't matter which one it is. You look at every one of those men. And none of them can achieve the plan of God unless they get the right bride. Abraham tried it with Hagar and God says, I'm not owning that because she's not your bride. She's a slave. God doesn't want slavery. God wants free people. Sarah had to birth the promise. Rebecca had to birth the promise, but Rebecca had to be found. The unnamed messenger had to go and find her. She was at the well. Where did Jesus go to find the Samaritan woman? At the well. Where did Moses go to find his wife? At the well. Because if you don't have the right bride, you're not going to have the right children. And the Bible says God is seeking holy offspring. You've got to have the right church to have the right Christians. If you've got the wrong church, you'll have the wrong Christians. Because the church is the bride of Christ. And so the search goes out and, 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 and the messengers, the eunuchs, these, these unnamed people are just going through everywhere looking for the right people who can be brought to the king of kings to be the next bride. And so in chapter 2, the search goes out. They're looking for the right bride. And if you know the story... They find one. And they name her Esther. The name of the book. But as I'm sure you know, that's not her name. She's called Hadassah. She's Jewish. She's one of God's people. But the Persians didn't know that. And then they, they renamed her Ishtar. Do you know in Hebrew, and again, this is... This is God's play on words. The word for hidden is ishtar. 
hidden. And when they pick her, Mordecai says, don't tell them who you really are. And they name her Ishtar. It's actually a Babylonian fertility goddess. But the Hebrew word means hidden. Almost identical. She's hidden. You know, the, the true nature of who you are is hidden. It's hidden to the world. But God knows who you are. God knows you're his bride. Your neighbors might not know who you are. This world might not know who you are. But God knows who you are. God knows who his bride is. And so Esther is chosen. She's beautiful. She fulfills all the criteria. And she is taken into the presence of the king. Jump to verse 12 of chapter 2. Verse 12 of chapter 2. So Esther's now taken into the presence of the king. So she's taken to the wedding banquet. No, not yet. Weddings take a lot of preparation. They're even harder to plan until you've got a, 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 a fiancé. Is anyone here planning a wedding before you found someone to marry? I did meet someone once who got their wedding dress and they'd not even got a boyfriend. thought that was a little bit odd, but never mind. The first thing you want to do is find the bride. If you find the bride, then you've got to get her ready for the wedding. And so, verse 12, before a young woman's turn came in to go into the King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the woman, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. This is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted would be given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there, and in the morning, she would return to another part of the harem in the care of the king's eunuchs. So, Esther, before she can go into the presence of the king, has to be cleaned up. She has to be purified. She has to be washed. She has to be perfumed. That's exactly what God is doing to the church right now. He's cleaning you. He's washing you with the water of the word. He's poiling, pouring his oil on you. He's putting his gifts in you. Gifts were given to them before they went into the presence of the king. The Holy Spirit doesn't just clean you up. He puts his gifts in you. So you're not just a pretty face. It's amazing when they have these beauty pageants on TV. They just go on how they look and what their plans are. No one actually asks them if they can do anything. I mean, that would be the first thing I asked. I didn't need to ask my wife. I already knew her. I knew she was good at stuff. God's not just looking for a beautiful bride. He's looking for a bride that actually does something. He's looking for a people that are going to use the gifts he's put in them. He's looking for someone who is actually going to be a beautiful, productive bride. It's described in Proverbs, at the end of the book of Proverbs, the wife of noble character who can find, and it, it describes that she's not idle, her hands are active. She provides clothing for her children, and it describes all that she does. And so Esther is made beautiful, and so she's brought into the presence of the king. There's two things you need that you cannot do without if you're going to be ready for the banquet. You need to be washed by the word of God and you need to be perfumed by the Holy Spirit. Without the word and the Holy Spirit, you won't even know who God is. Without the word and the Holy Spirit, you won't be ready for God. You won't know what to do. It's the word that, that cleanses you. Jesus says, my word is in you. You are already clean, but I'm going to send the comforter to you. He's going to tell you everything. He's going to take my words and make them real to you. The Holy Spirit is not a theological thought. He's a living reality. He's God himself who lives within you, who can speak to you, who can give you gifts and abilities supernaturally. Do not relegate him to just some theology. He is the person who is with us in the church right now. Esther received them both. She was washed, she was perfumed, and she received the gifts that the eunuchs gave her. She didn't insist on asking for what she wanted. She didn't say, well, I want a Gucci, a, a Gucci purse to go into the presence of the king. No, she said to the, the, the messenger, who's a picture of the Holy Spirit, she said, what do you think I need? Well, he knows what the king likes. He says, well, if I were you, 
I would take, and she would, he would give her a gift. The Holy Spirit knows what God likes, and that's what he wants to give you. Now, I know we rebel against that, because we think we know what we like, and we think we know what God likes. So we think we know what will please God. No, what pleases God is obeying what he said. What pleases God is obeying what the Holy Spirit gifts us and leads us to do. You can't operate in a gift you don't have. And I know this can be frustrating because I've, I've, I've found out that I'm a Bible teacher. But I always wanted to be an evangelist. And I tried really hard at being an evangelist. I just realized no one understood what I was talking about. I try and explain that, you know, the simple gospel and people would look at me as if I was crazy. Like, what are you talking about? And it took me years to realize I'm a pastor and a Bible teacher. I'm not an evangelist. I wanted to be like Billy Graham. I didn't want to be a Bible teacher. I thought they were boring. But you've got to be the, good, you've got to be the gift God made you. You can't be what God hasn't made you. And you will only find the comfort and the, the rest in your calling if you are what the gift that the Holy Spirit has made you in Christ. You can't be something else. My wife always said she wanted a husband who was tall, dark, and handsome. Well, she got two of the three. <laughs> you decide which one she didn't get. The way I'm going, she's only got one of the three. <laughs> Esther does it all. She responds. She submits. She lets the Holy Spirit lead her. Where's he taking her? He's taking her to the wedding banquet. That's where God's taking you. Don't have your, don't have your own plans. Vashti put on her own banquet. I know people today set up their own ministries. I have people come to me in my church, Pastor, I'm, I'm going to do this. It's like, who told you to put that banquet on? You've done that out of your own imagination. That's not linked to the church. That's not linked to what the Holy Spirit's doing. That's just something you're trying to do out of your own abilities. You're eating from the tree of knowledge. You're lending death. Jump to verse 17. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women. Do you know why? She did what the Holy Spirit told her to do. If you read the story, Mordecai, her adopted father, told her what to do. And it says she did everything he said. Today submission is a dirty word. We don't want to do what anybody tells us to do. Because we think we know God better than anybody else. So we don't want to even do what our spiritual leaders want to tell us. Because we want to rebel and do our own thing. And then waste 20 years of our life achieving nothing. And then realizing we'd been stupid. The king was attracted to Esther. More than any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. Why did she win his approval? Because she was doing the right thing. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet. Listen, for all his nobles and officials, he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts within his royal liberality. The king puts on the same banquet again that he put on originally, that seven-day banquet for everyone with all his liberality, the banquet is on again, guys. And this time, I've got a proper queen. This time, I've got the right bride. This time, I've got a bride that's perfect, pure, beautiful, holy, submissive, gifted, talented. Everything I ever wanted, I've now got. So now, there's the wedding banquet. And it's called Esther's Banquet. It's called the Bride's Supper. Banquet. Meal, celebration, holiday, it calls it there. Special occasion. And so you would think, you would think here at the, uh, not even at the end of chapter two, you would think, that's it. Let, let's just end the story there. I mean, that's what Disney does, isn't it? 
Have you noticed Disney always ends at that point? The princess meets the prince, they get married, they live happily ever after. I bet they had a few problems later. Who's with me? I bet a week or so later, you know, he threw his socks on the floor and she says, hold on a minute, I'm not having this. Don't you know where the laundry basket is? Come on. I'm sure within a few months, even Cinderella was starting to say, don't you do anything in the kitchen? <laughs> Come on, are you with me? They lived happily ever after. No, they didn't. No, 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 not on this earth they didn't. In heaven maybe, no, no, not on this earth, you know. I, I, do you know those Christians who say, me and my wife never have a crossword? I'm not so sure they're telling the truth. I mean, me and my wife disagree about everything. But we love each other. And we come to some agreements and agree I was right. <laughs> That's not true. And so they're married and they've had the wedding banquet and everything's wonderful. But there's a problem. Now it describes some of the problems in chapter three. Jump to chapter four. I've got to go through these quickly now. Go to chapter four. Um, and go to verse 12. We'll, we'll skip the first half of the chapter. So Esther's still talking to Mordecai. And Mordecai is warning Esther, look, there's a problem. There's a guy out to kill the Jews. And Esther, remember... You're Jewish. Remember, don't forget your identity. Remember, you are one of God's people. Remember, there's a reason that you're there. It's not just so you can have a lovely life. It's not just so that you can live happily ever after. It's not just so that you can have a perfect life. Now you're a Christian. He sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. What position? Her place at the banquet. Her place at the king's table. Her position as the bride. Esther. You're not in this just so that you can have a, a happy, blessed life. You're in this to make sure God's will is done. You're there to make sure the right thing happens. You've been put into this position, Esther, as the bride, so that you can make sure that God's people are protected. Verse 15, then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, the capital city, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go into the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Remember what had happened previously. The previous, the previous bride was cast out for disobeying the king. And so now Esther's going to go into God's presence, but she's going to fast first. Don't think being at God's banquet means that you are just going to be happy and fulfilled all the time. If you're going to be at God's banquet, if you're going to be his bride, there are times you're going to have to fast. Or there'll be no spiritual breakthrough. There are going to be times you're going to have to intercede and pray. It's no good expecting someone else to do it. She had to do it. Mordecai says, you've got to do this. I was chatting to someone in my church even, even this, this past week and they were saying, Pastor, will you pray about this? And then they told me what the problem was. A very serious issue in their family. And I says, well, I will pray, but let me tell you, if you don't fast and pray about this, you'll never break that demonic stronghold. You're gonna have to fast and pray. And God will give the answer. But if you're just, if you're just relying on the pastor's prayers, that's not enough. 
Esther's saying, well, Mordecai, you pray. He's a great man. He's a religious man. He's, he, he's a righteous man. He's one of the most righteous men in the world. But he says, no, Esther, you've got to do it. You better fast and pray or it's your family that's going to suffer. You've got to intercede. You've got to do this. And you know the story? Esther says, well, I'll do it then. And she fasts for three days and she says, if I perish, I perish. Chapter five, verse one, quickly then. So on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on the royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her. He held out the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The king asked her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. So Esther now isn't killed. I mean, that's an amazing thing. Because anyone coming into the king's presence without his permission, the bodyguards would usually just kill them. But she puts on the royal robes. She puts on her wedding garments. And if you're wearing the wedding garments, according to Jesus' parables, you're allowed to stay in the banquet. If you put on the garment of praise and the garment of salvation, and if you're clothed in the Holy Spirit, God allows you into his presence. You're forgiven. You're accepted. So Esther there comes to the king and the, come say, the king says, well, what is it you want? So here is her opportunity. Here is her chance. Now she can say, well, please don't kill me. Please don't let my family be murdered. Please don't let this, this edict that you have released through Haman, this, the wicked man, don't let it happen. She could write there. I mean, what has he just said? I'll give you half the kingdom. I mean, that's a pretty good promise, isn't it? We, we arrived in the USA, um, what day is it? I have no idea what day it is. Tuesday, Wednesday, are we, it's Wednesday? Is it Thursday? Are you sure? Okay, I believe you. So we arrived at 4 a.m. Tuesday morning to us. And uh, my daughter who sat over there, she, uh, she's staying with Brittany in a different part of Kentucky. We're staying in a different place. And my wife gave my daughter my credit card. I, I didn't say yes, she just did it. Because, oh, she'll need some money. That's a pretty dangerous thing to do, isn't it? The king's just said to Esther, what is it you want? Up to half the kingdom. He owned the planet. There's her opportunity. It's like, well, all I need to tell him is like, don't kill me and my family. Surely he's going to give me that. He's just said I can have half the kingdom. I mean, I mean, that's a pretty good opportunity to ask for everything you've ever wanted, isn't it? I mean, I would have said, don't kill me and my family, and can I have Hawaii? <laughs> what does she ask for? Verse 4, chapter 5. If it pleases the king, notice her submission, notice the honor, notice the respect that she's using. Let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Oh, is that it? You've risked your life to have a banquet with the king? That's it? Yeah. Because the banquet's everything. If you can banquet with the king, if you can come to the king's table, if you can get into the presence of the king, you're going to get everything. That's what Adam and Eve lost in the beginning. They lost being in that banquet. They lost access to the tree of life. When Jesus was at the banquet with his disciples, he says, until now you have asked me nothing. Ask now and your, your joy will be complete. You will ask in my name. You will ask in the Father's name. And the Father will give it to you. Why? Because you're at the banquet. 
The bread and wine is here. You're supping, you're communing with me. If you do that, genuinely do that, ask, and God will give you whatever you ask in my name. Jesus only ever said that at the banquet table. He didn't say it anywhere else. He says, you haven't asked before, but now we're at the banquet table. Now you've made it. Now you understand. Now you're in the right position. That's a request. Let the king come to the banquet table. So the king says, okay, bring Haman at once so that we may do what Esther asks. I mean, the king hasn't got a clue what's going on, like most men. But I'm sure he had a few hints. You know, men, when you come home from work, your, mom, your wife's put on your favorite food. Yeah? You know there's something up, don't you? You know, like, okay, this is nice. What is it she's going to ask for? Is she just doing this for the sake of it? Or is she going to, and all the time you're eating that juicy steak and you're eating your favorite food, you're thinking, when's she going to ask? What is it she really wants? What is she going to ask for? So they go to the banquet. Fourth banquet. And so the king, him and they went to the banquet. Esther had prepared. Notice this, verse 6, chapter 5. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now what is it you want? Now he loves Esther. She's the perfect bride. She's a picture of the church. What is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. So now, she's put on the banquet. She's communing with a bridegroom. She's in intimacy. She's in fellowship. Just like we are as the church, we're in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We're drinking the, the wine. We're eating the bread. We're communing with Jesus, what is, which is what church is, as we looked at yesterday. Now is the chance to release the petition. Now is the time to release the request to obtain the promise of God. Now is the right time to do it. Verse 7, Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor... And if it pleases the king, again, notice the humility, the reverence, the respect, the submission, which is lacking in many Christians' lives, pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request. Let him come to another banquet tomorrow. We would not do this. We would probably have jumped in at the first chance and asked for a new car or whatever. You know, the minute the king says, what do you want? We'd have been right in there. Can I have this? Okay, there you go. Up to half the kingdom. Certainly at the second banquet, we'd go, okay, we're at the banquet now. You know, he's had a bit to drink. He's had some nice steak. He's going to give me whatever he wants. That's what Herod did at his banquet. He got drunk and then Herodias asked for something that he didn't want to give, but he'd already promised it. That's what false banqueting does. That's what a false church does. Gives you false promises. She doesn't. She says, can we have another banquet? What's going on? She's revealing the true nature of the true bride. You see, the true bride is not in church to get something. The true, the true church meets together to be something. You're here because you love the heavenly bridegroom, Jesus Christ. You're not using him to get something out of him. You're not manipulating him so that he can give you what you want. You're here to worship him. The banquet's everything to you. The bread and the wine, the, the picture of Jesus himself, the, the, the forgiveness and the love and the grace that he's given you, that's everything to you. That, that's all you want. You know if you can have him, you'll have everything. You know if you belong to him, you'll have everything. 
You know, when my wife married me, she didn't start by saying, well, what will you, what can I have? What can, she knew once we were married, she got everything. Up to half the kingdom, as if you know the wife gets everything. She doesn't get half. My wife doesn't get half the house. It's her house. Sometimes I get a, a say in what happens. Sometimes. She knows that if she's the real bride and she's not like the previous one who rebelled and the, and the one who put on her own banquet and the one who did her own stuff, she knows if she submits and honors and, and gives him the respect and she submits to him in love and loyalty, she knows if I'm just with him at that banquet, he's going to give me everything. Because that's what he's really looking for. Do you know what God's looking for? Is love and loyalty. That's what Jesus was looking for. The people Jesus loved the most were the people who were just loving and loyal. The people who Jesus commended the most were usually women at banquets, by the way. Have you noticed that? You have noticed that the people Jesus commended the most were women at banquets. The sinful woman, weeping and washing his feet with her, with her hair. We looked at that yesterday. Mary of Bethany, the woman at the banquet. There was a banquet held in honor of Jesus at Martha's house. All the disciples were there. What was Mary doing? Worshipping Jesus. What were the disciples doing? Criticizing Mary. What did Jesus say? Leave her alone. What she has done, wherever the gospel is preached, what she has done will be repeated in memory of her. What she's done will never be forgiven. She knows I'm going to my burial. You guys are going to miss it. You're not going to be there. You're not going to be there when I raise from the dead. You're going to run away scared. She's going to be there. She knows what's going on. Because she loved him. And that's the only reason she was there. She wasn't there because she was going to be appointed as an apostle. Because she wasn't. She wasn't there because she was going to get a pastoral position. Because she wasn't going to be given one. She wasn't there to sit at his right hand and left hand. As James and John had asked. Because she wasn't going to get that. She was there to worship. And because she worshipped. Jesus says she's going to get everything. He says what she has chosen is greater. It will not be taken from her. And Judas couldn't handle it. And so he went out and sold Jesus because he was offended that Jesus would let her lavish all that money upon him and not let him have the money for his own ministry. How many people say the church hasn't supported my ministry? The church is not there to support your ministry. Your ministry is there to support the church. Mary wasn't there trying to get any money out of Jesus. She was lavishing all her money on him. And Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Do you know in the Levitical code, every person had a price of silver on their heads. Children were sold for five pieces of silver. People not of fighting age, but young people, were sold for 20 pieces of silver. Men of fighting age were sold for 50 pieces of silver. Do you know who was sold for 30 pieces of silver? Brides. Jesus died for his bride. That's why 30 pieces of silver was counted out. It's the price of a bride. Jesus was willing to die to purchase a bride at the banquet who was worshipping him. That's what Esther's doing. Esther is a story of the Bible in miniature. Can we have another banquet? Can we have another banquet? And so, my petition and fulfill my request. Come tomorrow to another banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Her desire is to be at the banquet with the king. So, they put on another banquet. Chapter 7, verse 1. And I'll wrap this together now. Two more banquets to go. 
So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. As they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked. Right? Just think how many banquets the king has now been to with Esther. Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. The king offers the same promise to his bride at the banquet. Queen Esther answered. Now, notice what's happening here. Who's Esther invited to the banquet? The king and the problem. She's invited Haman to the banquet. That's a little bit strange, isn't it? Why would you bring the problem to the banquet? You're supposed to bring your problem to the banquet because Esther's problem is that she's got someone she can't deal with. She's got a problem she doesn't know how to handle. She's got someone trying to kill her. She's got someone trying to destroy her family. She's got something more powerful than her and she's not able to deal with him. But if she brings him to the banquet, her husband is more powerful than him. As powerful as he is, as, 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 as ruthless and vindictive and murderous as he is, he is as nothing compared to the king of kings. And the king of kings is her husband. You see, Esther knows how to deal with the problem. If only Christians could grasp this. What we do is say, well, we'll sort him and out. You won't sort out the devil. He will make mincemeat of you. In fact, the minute you try to sort him out, he's already won. Because you cannot overcome the devil. The only way you overcome the devil is by your testimony and the blood of the lamb. You can't do it. Don't make the mistake of Peter saying, I'll sort this out. I've got a sword. You'll end up running away. She brings him to the table. She brings the problem. She brings the situation. She brings this demon. She brings this satanic problem to the table of the king. When you come into God's presence, bring your problem. Bring it to someone who can actually sort it out. Bring it to the one who's actually already sorted out by his own blood. Jesus says, the prince of this world is coming. He has nothing in me. Now the prince of this world is cast out. Do you know when Jesus said that? At the banquet. As they were eating bread and wine. Esther comes, she puts on bread and wine. As they are drinking wine, she's now going to address the problem. When she's got the forgiveness, when she's got the grace, when she's got the presence of God, when she's in the right position, when she's submissive, when she loves her Lord and Master, when she's doing the right thing, when she's got everything in place, now she's going to bring the petition. At the banquet, at the table. When the wine is there, as they are drinking wine, Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. Don't let him kill me. What do you think the king's going to say? He loves you with an everlasting love. He's not going to let anyone hurt you. Jesus isn't going to let the Antichrist take his bride. Because that's what Haman is. He's a picture of Antichrist. He's trying to kill all the Jews. Spare my life. Spare my people. This is my request. Verse 5. The king says to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he? Who has dared to threaten my bride? And do you know what Esther says? He's there. Him. Notice, notice here what she said. 
in verse 6, when the king says, where is he? Who is he? And who has dared to do this? Look at verse 6. Esther said, the adversary and the enemy, this vile Haman. In Hebrew, adversary is Satan. The enemy, Haman. Notice what Esther does not do at the banquet. She doesn't attack Haman. She doesn't throw a glass of wine at Haman. She doesn't tell the bodyguards to kill Haman. She tells the king what he's doing and who he is. He's the adversary. He's the Satan. He's the enemy. He's the Antichrist. And he's trying to attack us. He wants to kill me. Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Haman is not scared primarily of Esther. Satan is not really scared of you. He's terrified of Jesus Christ. He's terrified if you belong to Jesus Christ because you're his bride and he knows he has no power over you because he knows Jesus will never allow him to take his bride. He's terrified at the table. This is the situation of church. This is where we are now. We can bring our problem to Jesus. We're here to worship Jesus. We're here to adore him at the banquet. We're here to praise him and give him all the glory. But we're also here to give him the problems and the sins and the accusations. And he will cast them out. He'll deliver you from them. If you're honest with him and truthful. She didn't hide it. She brought it to the table. The problem. The king got up in a rage and left his wine and went out to the palace garden. Now the king gets up and storms out. Not the queen. And he leaves the wine. There's no forgiveness now. The wine is the forgiveness of sins. The king leaves that. There's no forgiveness for Satan. There's no forgiveness for evil. There's no forgiveness for the enemy or the adversary or demons. The king is going to remove them at the banquet. But the queen is safe. And if you know the story, the king comes back to the banquet table. He walks back in to the banquet table. And Haman, in his audacity, dares to touch the bride. And if you read the story, the king, the king doesn't even really say anything. He said, dare you even touch my bride in my presence? And the bodyguards take him out and execute him. Your safety is at the banquet table. Your safety is in the presence of God. And so Esther is spared. The problem is removed. Satan is defeated. And the adversary is dealt with. But it doesn't end there. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9 and verse 21. They issue a decree to have all the people, all the Jews, to celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, at the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. The final feast, the final banquet is a banquet of rejoicing and celebration in the reality that God has delivered them from all of their problems that God has delivered them from all the enemies, that God has delivered them from all accusation, that God has delivered them from all the sins that beset them. And that was the final feast in the Jewish calendar, the feast of Purim, the feast of the bride, the feast of Esther. And that's where we're heading. That's where we're going. But we're at the table now. We're in church now. We're in this situation now. The situation we've just read about in Esther, that's our situation right now. We're right in that situation. What are we going to do about it? 
well, why don't we do the same thing that Esther did? Why don't we submit to our king, worship him, adore him, tell him to deal with the situation, petition him by honoring him, by giving him all the glory, by giving him all the praise and letting the heavenly bridegroom deal with anything that would dare to touch his bride. Why don't we do that? Do you know you can do that right now? Because you're at the banquet right now. Because you're in church. And church is the banquet. Church is where we celebrate the Lord. Church is where we remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Church is where we worship him. Church is where the Holy Spirit moves. Church is where the answers are given. Church is where everything God wants to give us is released. Church is the ultimate plan of God. God's plan was always to have this, even in Eden. He knew what Adam and Eve would do. But he knows his perfect bride isn't going to do that because we know what our husband, our bridegroom did for us. He died for us. And we know he purchased us and we know he loves us. So we're not going to fall for that trick. We're going to submit to him. Can we all just bow our heads? Just for a few moments now as we close. Just bow your heads. I'm not going to give an altar call. I want us to do something different. As you are sat in your seat, you are seated at the table of the Lord. You are seated at the feast of God, the supper of God. You are seated at the banquet table. God, God brought you here and put you in that seat because he wants you to be part of his bride, the church. And you're there right now. You've accepted the invitation or you wouldn't be here. You've already come. You're a wise virgin. You've come to church. You've come to the wedding feast. You're here. What are you going to do now? Well, you're going to give thanks to your God. You're going to praise your God. You've already done that at the beginning of the service. What do you want from God? Well, first of all, you want God. Whatever petition you have, whatever thing you desire, whatever it is you need, you know God already knows that. What's your real desire? Surely your real desire is to have God himself, is to belong to him, is to have the Holy Spirit flowing through you, is to belong to Jesus Christ. Surely that's the most important thing, isn't it? Isn't that what you really need? Isn't that what you really want? He's going to give you the gifts. He's going to pour his love on you. He's going to give you the oil and the wine and the perfume. He's going to lavish his love upon you. How great is the love that God the Father has lavished upon us in Jesus Christ that we would be called children of God and such as you are. Well, you're here. You're at the table. You're at the banquet. We're going to a greater banquet. This banquet goes on forever. But you're here now in the presence of God. Just say thank you to the Lord. Just honor the King of Kings because he is here with us. Just give him some honor and glory and power and praise and thanks. Our salvation has been given to us. We were chosen from the nations of the world to belong to Jesus Christ. And we're going to submit to our God. And as you sat there right now, that issue you're worried about, because there's always a problem, Satan's always, always issuing his threats. He roars like a roaring lion, prowling, trying to devour. That issue, that problem, just give it to the Lord right now. And say, Lord, this is my petition. Keep me from the evil one. That's what Jesus prayed at the banquet. His high, high priestly prayer. Father, keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one. Keep them by that name which I have given them. The husband gives his name to his wife. Jesus puts his name over you. You will be kept from the evil one. Jesus says he has nothing in me. 
and he's going to have nothing in his church. Only Christ is in his church. Just release that problem to the Lord right now. Just release that problem. Just say to God, I'm not going to fight this, Lord, but are you going to let this, are you going to let this happen to your bride? Are you going to let your church be harmed, Lord? Are you going to let this evil come upon the church? No, of course he's not. Of course he's not. But you've got to release it to him. You don't attack Satan. You say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you. His bride is pure. You're not touching her. We're at the banquet of God, the wine of forgiveness. Just release that to the Lord right now. Apostle Paul told us he will deliver us from every attack of the devil. He will lead us into victory. He will deliver us from every accusation. Every tongue raised in accusation against you will be cast down. But only if you're in full submission to God. Don't fight it yourself. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's got to be the submission to God. Or Satan won't flee. It's the blood of Jesus he's afraid of. It's the name of Jesus he has no power over. And you're at the table drinking the wine, the blood of Jesus Christ, and his banner over you is love. The name of Jesus is written over your life. You don't belong to anyone else. You're the bride of Christ. You belong to Jesus Christ. So just release all that to the Lord right now. And I'm going to pray over us in the name of Jesus the authority of his word in the power of the Holy Spirit under the covering of his blood and everything that God has said in that story of Esther will be ratified in your life on the authority of God's word so I'm going to pray to the Lord right now Father thank you for every person in this room who is sat at your table who is at your banquet who has been chosen as your bride who has been handpicked by God, who has been led by the Holy Spirit and accepted the invitation to be at this church tonight. Now, Lord, thank you for the protection of the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blood of the Lamb over the doorpost. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the wine of forgiveness that has cleansed every person here from their sins. Thank you, Lord, for that. That is what our faith is in. That is what our trust is in. Now, Lord... As you taught us to pray, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver this church from every accusation. Deliver every member from every, every false lie. Deliver them from all the tricks of the evil one. And Lord, let your bride come, come forth pure, holy, spotless and clean. Praising you, belonging to you and celebrating at your banquet in the garments of salvation praising the name of Jesus because he has delivered us from all the attacks of the evil one. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, we don't look at Satan, we look at you because we see the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. And Lord, we look at you now, we praise you. We give you all our honor. We honor you with our bodies, with our lives because this is our acceptable worship, serving you. Lord, may this church grow and be fruitful and continue to celebrate through praising and glorifying Jesus Christ and being protected from all evil and being fruitful and multiplying for God. This will happen, Lord, because you have said it. Let it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Matt, do you want to come? You guys don't have to clap when I come up. So. <laughs> that was amazing. The part that got me, the part that got me is taking your problem to your king. When I was young, you know, 
our young guys, they don't know these old songs. But I know Micaiah can follow anything you start singing. But there was a song that said, um, Leave it there, leave it there. You know it. I hear some people. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If you'll trust and never doubt, he will surely see you out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. It's just what he said. She took her problem to her king. Her problem looked big until he got before her king. Then he looked small. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Father God, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for this powerful word. That we can bring every problem. We can bring ashes and you'll give us beauty. We can take our dilemma, our problem, our circumstance before you. And your glory overshadows in your power, Lord God. You are a powerful, mighty God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, our King. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He will surely see you out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. It is time to move, O oh Lord, for the psalmist say, For men have made your law, what did they say? Vain, but it is time to move. How many of you believe God's moving? Amen. Father, we thank you. We praise you. May the Lord bless you, keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. You can clap for Dave now. <laughs> Pastor Philip, we're so glad you were here with us. And the whole family, you know, all of you guys that came. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. Hey, ushers at the door, if you would like to give, you want, you want to sow into this ministry. Everything, anything you give goes right to Pastor Dave. You know, I, I preached at a place one time. This is a funny story because this church is no longer in existence. But I preached at a church one time, and it was a pitiful little place. But I, they kept begging me to go there, and it was in Kentucky. And so... <laughs> I noticed when I went in that one of their windows was busted out. It's probably a, the last preacher that got mad. But uh, they were receiving the offering, and I put a $20 bill in the offering. This was like a long time ago. I put a $20 bill in the offering, and uh, the pastor got up and said, everything that goes, I didn't realize the offering already passed by me. He said, everything goes to the, in the offering plate tonight goes to the evangelist. I was the evangelist. You know, at the end of the night, they gave me $17. I was like, I don't know how that happened. Bidenomics, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I put in a 20. <laughs> and I got an offering of $17. I don't know how that happened. All I know is that church is no longer in existence. Hey, be it unto you according to your faith. But uh, uh, I promise you, if you put a gum wrapper in the offering plate, it will go to him. We'll give him the gum wrapper. So God bless you. I love you. Have a great night. And all of the, hey, these ladies up here from Wisconsin and where, where else was it? Minnesota. I like the way you say it. Minnesota. You guys, man. God bless you guys. Give them a hand. They, I know God's going to bless you. They drove five and six hours to be here. Amen. Which is 
12 hours by the time experience. you get home. We hope that you like and subscribe us on YouTube. Check out our website at fopchurch.net where we also have an app on the Roku TV station. We hope to 